All right, today I want to do a study of Matthew chapter 24. Uh, I just want to say that this is probably one of the most difficult chapters in the New Testament. Uh, I had a request from a brother over in Australia to put together a message on Matthew ch chapter 24, and I've really been wanting to do a verse-by-verse -verse study of this chapter. Um, it's going to be a big study. If you're looking for kind of a light, milky message, well, this isn't it. Okay, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14 says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay, this study, um, it's not that a new Christian won't be able to understand it, but this is definitely a strong meat message. There's going to be a lot of scriptures that we're going to cover. Um, I have them typed out, so there's not going to be much time to look them up in your Bible. You'll have to pause it if you want to follow along in your Bible, because I really have to move here. Okay, now with that said, let me get into this. All right, Matthew chapter 24. One thing I want to say quickly is that really you ought to read Matthew chapter 23 before you study chapter 24 because chapter 23 is about Jesus rebuking the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees because they had traditions that they held higher uh, as far as respect is concerned. They held them higher than the Word of God. Okay, now a lot of uh, modern apostate professing Christians will try to make Bible believers out to be the Pharisees because we cling to the Word of God and it's our standard uh, in all matters of faith and practice. Well, that's not accurate. Um, if you want to see a good example of a modern-day Pharisee, it's somebody who elevates their own traditions and their own feelings above that of Scripture. So in actuality, the modern apostate professing Christian that does not use the Bible as their final authority, they're more like the Pharisees that Jesus rebuked than somebody who clings to the Word of God and bases their life on it. So, Jesus is rebuking the religious leaders of his day because they had their traditions that they held above the Word of God. And then he leaves that temple, and that's where we begin here. Okay, and something else I want to say too before we get into it, is that um, there are three accounts basically of the tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The three accounts in the Gospels are Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Okay, and then there's also some stuff in Luke 17. We're going to get into that. But uh, another thing I want to say, there's a lot that I need to cover here, so bear with me. But one other thing that I need to say about Matthew chapter 24 is that doctrinally Matthew 24 is in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15 through 17 says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, speaking of Jesus Christ, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For a where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Okay, Jesus Christ was alive and walking around on the earth at the time that he spoke Matthew chapter 24. He had not died on the cross yet. Okay, the blood that was shed on the cross is what brought in the New Testament. All right, the New Testament had not happened in Matthew chapter 24. All right, that, hap that doesn't happen until basically Matthew chapter 27 is when you read about that. So Matthew chapter 24 is not being addressed doctrinally to Christians. Okay, it's being addressed to Jews in the Old Testament and if you read or if you listen to some of our other studies at Sermon Audio um you'll see that the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation is specifically a time for the Jews. Okay? I can't get into all that here that's been covered in other messages. So Matthew chapter 24 is doctrinally for a Jew who will be under faith and works in the tribulation. And we're going to see that as we go through the study. I'm going to prove it to you. And that's who Matthew chapter 24 is written to. It's not written to Christians in the body of Christ living today. Okay, 
Just keep that in mind as we go through the study here. You're going to see a lot of that uh, coming true. All right, Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, now we go to Mark chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, and we read a similar account, but a little bit more detail. Mark chapter 13, verse 1, and, has, and as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. So one of his disciples, it was only one of them really that was asking. And the others were there and they were listening and things. That's why in Matthew chapter 24 it says his disciples came to him. Okay, and it, it says about that they came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. It doesn't say that they all asked. Mark 13, verse 1, says that it was only one of them that asked. Mark 13, verse 2, And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So, Mark 13, 2, Matthew 24, 2, basically saying the same things. But uh, Mark 13, verse 1, says that one of his disciples said unto him, Master, See what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Okay, now we'll go to Luke chapter 21, and we'll read down a couple of verses here, and we're gonna, I'm going to try to show you who, the, who I believe this disciple was, the disciple that asked Jesus, or that said to him about the temple, that was impressed by the temple. Luke chapter 21, verse 1. And he looked up and saw the rich men cast, casting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these have of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God, but she of her penury hath cast in all the living that she had. Okay? So you see a little lesson there in the beginning of, of Luke chapter 21 about the fact that God sees, he doesn't care about the amount that you give. Okay, he cares. He cares about the heart condition of why you're giving to the Lord's work. All right, Luke twenty-one verse five. And as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, As for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. All right, so you see the three accounts there that Jesus prophesied that that this temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. But now, who was the disciple which showed Jesus the buildings of the temple? Well, if you notice there in Mark, it says about that he said, Master. Now, there was one of the, one of the disciples, they all would say it occasionally, but there was one disciple that continually was saying, Master, a lot. And, of course, the uh, Pharisees many times, when they would come to Jesus, they would call him Master. So uh, let's look here, Matthew chapter 26, verse 25. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And then if you jump down to verse 49 there, Matthew 26, 49, And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. So you see, Ju Judas uses this term, Master. Almost every time that he speaks in the, in the Gospels there, you'll see him calling Jesus Master. But I'm going to show you another reason here why I believe it was Judas that uh, was the one that was showing the buildings of the temple to Jesus Christ. Okay. The second reason is because Judas was the one who held the money of the, of the disciples there. John 12, 3. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. And then if you go to John thirteen twenty nine, it says, For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things 
that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So you see, Judas was the treasurer, if you will, of the twelve disciples. And he was a cheapskate, which is kind of interesting because you'll see that sometimes, a lot of times, in fact, that, that many times people that have a lot of money are very stingy with it. So, and what are those people impressed by? They're impressed by big buildings, fancy cars, you know, nice clothes. They're impressed with material things. Okay, and why is that? Well, First Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and peered themsel pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So, if the love of money is the root of all evil, and Judas Iscariot, Jesus calls him a devil at one point, well, then Judas would probably love money. So, I can't be real dogmatic about it, but I do believe that the disciple that came there in Matthew 20, 24, verse 1, Mark 13, verse 1, and in Luke 21, I believe that that disciple was Judas Iscariot. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, who were these disciples that wanted to know about the future? Well, Mark 13, verse 3 says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? So, it lists the disciples that came to Jesus in Mark chapter 13, verse 3. And notice that Judas Iscariot is not one of them. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, what does that show? See, this is actually very good instruction in righteousness because it shows that there are two types of believers. There are the types of Christians, and, and I'm using this for instruction in righteousness. I'm not trying to teach doctrine here. I'm just saying there are two types of Christians. The one type, uh, they love big churches and huge Bible schools and fancy clothes and cars and mansions. They like money. They're impressed with material things. And these types of people cannot stand negative preaching, negative messages, negative thinking. They can't handle it because they have made their heaven down here on this earth. That's why they're impressed with material things. Okay, They look at the world positively. Now, the second type of believer, if you want to call them that, second type of believer is the one who doesn't have a lot of money and who has had some trouble here on the earth. And as a result, they are really kind of looking forward to leaving. <laughs> you know, the, the thought of heaven is very precious and dear to this type of Christian. Okay, they don't care about the things of this earth, the riches and things. It's not impressive to them because they understand that heaven is going to be greater and far better than anything here on this earth. Okay, these types of Christians will cling to their Bibles and will seek the truth no matter what it costs them. See, they came to Jesus there at the Mount of Olives, Peter and James and John and Andrew, privately. See, Judas was not there. Judas was the type of believer, and I don't, you know, well, we won't get into the, whether or not he was saved. I don't think he was. Judas was the type of believer that, could not stand negative preaching. Okay, he looked at the world positively. Peter, James, John, and Andrew were the exact opposite. They looked at the world negatively. And they said, What are the signs of the end, you know, the of the end of the world and, and of thy coming? And tell us, tell us, we want to know. And you know, yeah, but it's gonna it's gonna make the world look bad. You know, you're gonna have to realize that things are gonna get worse. Yeah, we don't care, we want to know the truth. And see, that's the type of Christian that a message like this will appeal to. If you're looking for a revival and for things to get better, you're not going to enjoy this message because this message is negative. And Matthew chapter 24 is an extremely negative chapter. Okay, Things in Matthew 24 get worse and worse and worse. They don't get better. Okay, 
And this is why Jesus did not speak in front of Judas Iscariot. I mean, he could have walked out of the temple when they were all there and Judas said, hey, you know, uh, look at the buildings here. And Jesus could have said, well, let me tell you about that. But see, he didn't. He waited till the disciples came to him, which is also very interesting. But let's continue on here. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now notice in both those references, both talking about the end times, Okay, one of them pointed to Jews that are going to have to go through the tribulation, and the other in Timothy there pointing to Christians. Okay, because see, the closer we get to this tribulation time period, the Bible teaches that we're going to be raptured out before it actually begins, but we're going to see a lot of these end of the world prophecies coming to pass, and we certainly are. But notice that the deception there is religious, which is very interesting. Jesus said, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Okay? Now, that's kind of scary when you think about it. You see, because the main realm of deception is going to be spiritual. And I'll tell you right now, it doesn't take much study to see that this has come to pass. And you say, well, what should I do to protect myself? Get in the King James Bible and read it and study it and memorize it and don't put it down. Just keep reading it and studying it and staying by what you read in there. If it's not in there, if it's not in the Bible, yeah, you'd be best just staying away from it. If you don't know this Bible, if you don't know this book, you're going to be deceived. Just as simple as that. And by the way, I just want to say uh, as kind of a uh, interesting thing here. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. If you pick up a Catholic catechism, you can actually see that every Catholic priest is called another Christ. That is official Roman Catholic doctrine, that they are another Christ. And of course, they are deceiving millions and millions and millions of Catholics all around the world. Okay, and Catholicism has never been right, by the way. I'm not trying to defend Catholicism. It's always been wrong and a false system of belief. But they actually profess to be Christ. And of course, a lot of um, religious, quote-unquote, leaders out there do profess to be a Christ. So it's very interesting. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Now, there's a, a teaching that um, all the events of Revelation and, and uh, Matthew 24, of course, too, happened there in the first century. Well, that's ridiculous. And one of the best ways to, mis to disprove that is right there in Matthew 24, verse 6. Where are there wars and rumors of wars mentioned in the book of Acts? I don't remember reading any wars about any wars that were going on in the book of Acts. You know why? Because the Roman uh, Empire basically was ruling the known world at that time. Okay, now there you had Native American people over here in the Americas and everything. I understand that. And there was probably war going on over there. But as far as Jerusalem, Antioch, where they later were called Christians, all those areas were under Roman control. Okay, so these wars and rumors of wars, and we're going to see this as we continue here about nation rising against nation. There really was only one major nation back then, and it controlled everything. So this was not fulfilled in the first century. That's a lie. But as far as this thing of, of wars and rumors of wars, an increase in war, has that happened? It's interesting because since 1945... And this is an old number. I don't actually have an updated number. Since 1945, I think it was 1945 to 1990, there were, there were 150 wars. 
Now that's pretty significant. Think about the 20th century. You had two world wars, each with a death toll going into the, I think the first world war was over 10 million, the second world war over 30 million killed. Altogether, in the 20th century, over 200 million people were killed as a result of war. Now that is just unbelievable. Okay, I mean, it's amazing to think of 200 million people dying as a result of war in one century. I mean, it's incredible. And how are we doing in, here in the 21st century? See, it's already, we're already in a couple of wars. There are already wars and commotions and things and more on the way. But uh, let's go on to verse 7, Matthew chapter 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Okay, nation shall rise against nation. We'll look at that first. And kingdom against kingdom. Rome was a world power, like I just said, at that time, and really didn't fall until 395 when it was divided. In 476, the Western Empire, you know, it, it divided into the Eastern and the Western that's why you have the prophecy back there in Daniel about the two legs of iron. It was divided, okay? And in 476, the Western Empire of, of the Western branch of the Roman Empire fell. Okay, now what happened to the other part of the Roman Empire? Well, if you really study the thing, you will see that the Roman Empire basically morphed and became the Roman Catholic Church. No longer did you have Caesar sitting on the throne. Now you have the Pope sitting on the throne. And no longer do you have the Roman legions, the iron legions of Rome, the soldiers. Now you have priests and monks, and, you know, they are the ones that go out and conquer the world. And, of course, Roman Catholicism since day one has been a military superpower. And they appear religious and everything else, but the reality of it is that they have killed who they deem as being heretics. They've killed millions, tens of millions of Christians have been slaughtered by Rome down through the centuries. And if you go back into Daniel there and you study that, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, the image, the uh, statue of a man, and the legs of iron, and the feet part of iron, part of miry clay. So the feet have an element of the iron in them. Okay, so the Roman power is not totally destroyed it actually it changes okay but now let's continue uh it says there are famines there shall be famines okay now let's there again that's interesting i'm not going to provide a whole lot on this you can do the, your own research but for many years now the united states has not been able to produce enough food here in america to feed the american people we have to import our food and there's a lot of reasons for that. Like I said, I can't get into that right now. Pestilences. Well, the big thing here not too long ago was the H1N1 swine flu. We've had the avian flu, fears of that, Ebola, AIDS, anthrax, cancer. You know, and you can just list them. You know, many, many, many diseases going around. Pestilences there. And it says earthquakes in divers places. Divers places means many places, essentially. And, of course, the three big ones here that we've had within the last couple of months, we had one in Haiti, one in Chile, one in Turkey. And, I mean, it's happening all the time now and increasing. It's just amazing. I mean, it's almost every month now there's a major earthquake. So... Jesus gives these predictions, these prophecies in Matthew 24, 7, and they are coming to pass. Now, it says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 8, all these are the beginning of sorrows. So these signs that we're seeing happening, these things that are taking place right now on the earth, the earthquakes, the pestilences, kingdom rising against kingdom, rumors of wars, it hasn't even gotten bad yet. See, See the negative <laughs> character of Matthew chapter 24? Very negative. All right, now let's look at chapter 24, verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Okay, Revelation chapter 6, 9 says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God 
meaning that they had the Word of God, by the way, in the tribulation. A lot of people teach that the Word of God in its perfect form passed away with the original autographs in the first century. There again, that's another lie. We have the Word of God today preserved in English in the King James Bible, and people will eventually be killed for it. Uh, but it says uh, that they were slain for the Word of God and for the testimony which they held. Okay, Mark chapter 13, verse 9 says, But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Remember the thing about the testimony. That's going to come up a little bit later. They had the testimony of Jesus Christ. So you see that believers in this coming tribulation period are going to be killed. They're going to be executed in large numbers. Revelation twelve seventeen, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And again, we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail in just a little bit here. Now let's go on to Matthew 24, verse 10. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Okay, Mark chapter 13, verse 12, goes into a little bit more detail. It says, Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son. The children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. That's going to happen during the Great Tribulation. And I'm going to tell you right now, and you can do some research into this, if you study this green movement, this environmentalist movement with the carbon pollution and all this, do you realize that they talk about CO2 emission? You know, we need to eliminate CO2 emission. That's what you breathe out, okay? I'm making CO2 right now. So according to the Al Gore, you know, Bill Gates, all these environmentalist crazy people, uh, I'm polluting the atmosphere right now, which is nonsense. It's not even science. Okay, plants breathe in CO2. They have to have CO2. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because they are actually teaching children here in America, they're teaching them that your parents, you have to be police to your parents. And you actually, there are kids that are going home and they're, and they're having these little exercises where the kids go home and they write their parents uh, carbon tickets, you know, oh, you took a, a hot bath, that's bad for the environment. You threw a battery in the trash can, that's bad for the environment. And right now, people just kind of laugh about, oh, that's kind of cute, little little Jimmy coming home and writing his mommy and daddy a ticket. It's, it's funny now, but what's going to happen is, when this thing gets fully underway, you're going to have children literally turning in their parents, and you're going to have families that somebody says, I'm not taking the mark of the beast. And the brother, the sister, the, the father, the mother, the children, they're going to say to the authorities, my relative didn't take the mark. Put them in jail. They don't want to join with this one world government, this new world order. They should be put into prison. And you're actually going to have family members causing their relatives to be put to death. And it's already being set up. You can see it happening. All right, let's continue here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Again, we see the deception in these last days. It's not a return to truth. And I get so fed up with these Christians that are going around saying, I, I think that there's going to be a mighty revival. We're going to have revival here in America if we just turn from our wicked ways and, and seek the Lord. And you know, No, no, no. There's going to be many false prophets rising and deceiving many. Okay? And it's not just, well, a few are going to be deceived, a few are going to believe a lie. No. Many will be deceived. Your only chance is to be a King James Bible believer. Stay by the book. Do not be deceived by all these religious leaders out there. Okay? Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now what happens? Why is it that you have 
uh, family, the family structure breaking down, the husband and the wife having children, loving their children, the kids loving their parents, obeying, obeying their parents. Why is this breaking down? Why is there so much sexual perversion right now? Well, we're going to see the steps here. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now look, here's the reason why this happened. In verse 25, Romans 1, 25 says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Notice it does not say, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. A lot of the new versions out there, which can be traced back to the Roman Catholic Church, by the way, the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, <clears throat> are the two corrupt manuscripts that they will refer to, but it says that they changed the truth of God into a lie. The new versions say exchanged it for a lie. That's not what the Bible says. See, they have to cover up their own sins. What happens when you have people that take the Bible and they change it into a lie? They make it contradict because they come to it with their own reasoning and their own thoughts and they change it to fit their peculiar doctrines or whatever. You know, it's kind of interesting because the translators of the King James Version were Puritans and Anglicans. Those were the two main groups. And people say about, you know, they'll attack the Puritan doctrines, you know, of Calvinism and some of the other wacky things that they did. And they'll attack the Anglicans for some of their beliefs. And yet, the King James Bible comes out teaching neither the Puritan doctrines or the Anglican doctrines. Some of their doctrines will line up with the Bible, but the point is, it's not skewed to one system of belief. That's because God had his hand on the, on the King James Version, and the translators translated the King James Version as close to Greek and Hebrew as they could. It's a literal translation, okay? But a lot of these new versions, you get a guy who's a Calvinist, and he translates it to fit Calvinism. You get a guy who's a liberal, and he'll go through places that he doesn't like that kind of condemn him, and he'll change it. He changes the truth of God into a lie. And when a society does that, then you have what happens here in Romans. Romans one we We'll read down through and we'll see what happens. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do, the, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness and fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, <clears throat> who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Okay? Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You go down through that list, the boasters, the proud, the inventors, inventors of evil things, go down through that list, you can find it in abundance. In America, in Australia, in the UK, anywhere. Any country on earth, you can find all of those things. Haters of God, despiteful, backbiters, whisperers, you know, debate, deceit, murder. It's everywhere. Why? Because they departed from the words of God. That's the reason. But let's continue on here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now there are more people messed up in their doctrine because they take Matthew 24 and 13 and they apply it to today. And so you have Christians going around saying that they have to endure to the end to be saved. Uh, as I've stated earlier, this verse has nothing to do with a Christian in the church age that we live in right now. Okay, the church age ends at 
the rapture, which happens before the tribulation. And then at that point, <clears throat> a believer in Jesus Christ is going to have to endure to the end of that tribulation in order to be saved. Now, why is that? Well, because the mark of the beast shows up. Revelation 13, you can read about that. And anybody who takes it goes to hell. There again, don't let anybody deceive you. There are people going around teaching that you can take the mark of the beast, that a somebody in the tribulation can take the mark of the beast, and that they can still be saved. That's a lie. It's not what the Bible teaches. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to prove that. Revelation 14, verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. <clears throat> Revelation 14.12 Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you have works and faith there in the trib tribulation for a tribulation saint. Okay, they have to endure to the end. And as I stated earlier, Christians leave before the Antichrist shows up. And you can read about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. You can read that the Antichrist actually can't show up until he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. It says there in 2 Thessalonians. And that he who now letteth is the body of Christ. When we leave, then the Antichrist will show up. But let me just show you a couple things here quickly as far as this thing of uh, a Christian having to endure to the end, and, and why that Matthew twenty four thirteen does not apply to a Christian in the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter one verse ten says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Okay, now, verse 11 there, it says about being predestinated according to the purpose of him. Okay, <clears throat> now that does not have, that's not a reference to salvation that you were chosen and you had no say in the matter. Okay, like Calvinism teaches. That's not what's being spoken of there. Predestination there in Ephesians 1.11 is talking about when you get saved, your destination is fixed. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, your destination is heaven. Now when you get saved, do you go to heaven immediately? No. That happens when you die, okay? But you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And your destination, as far as eternity is concerned, is set at that point, okay? <clears throat> but it says there about the purchased possession. What, who is the purchased possession? Acts twenty twenty eight says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Okay? A Christian today, if you are saved, you have eternal Security. You don't have to worry about losing your salvation because it's not your salvation. You were bought with a price. You make the decision of your own free will. I'm a sinner. I need to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. But then you come to God and you say, 
I would like to accept Jesus Christ and the, and the blood that he shed on the cross to pay for my sins. And God looks at your heart <clears throat> and he sees, okay, this guy's sincere, this woman is sincere, then he'll take you. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? I've seen atheists mockingly, you know, act like they're getting saved or whatever to mock. Well, obviously they're not getting saved. They're calling on the name of the Lord, but it's in a mocking tone. Okay, that's why they're doing it. They're not saved. If you come to the Lord with a sincere heart saying, I need to get saved, God will save you. And at that point, your destination is fixed and you are on your way to heaven. You don't have to endure to the end. Okay, but now a tribulation saint, they do the same thing. Their heart is sincere. Their heart is right. And they're saying, I'm a sinner. I need to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. But... Now you have an added thing in the tribulation where they can't take the mark of the beast. And if they do, they will lose that salvation. So it's a different thing. Okay, now let's continue on here. Matthew 24, verse 14. And here we have another problem if you try to make this Christian doctrine. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay, now there are two different kingdoms that are preached in the the book of Matthew. It's interesting because these two kingdoms are only preached in the book of Matthew. Okay, the first kingdom is the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Luke 17, verses 20 through 21 says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Romans 14, verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Okay, the kingdom of God in most of the references in the four Gospels and then, of course, through the Pauline epistles, the kingdom of God is usually a reference to spiritual, the spiritual kingdom okay in other words if you want to be in contact with the lord if you want to uh stay in communion with him that is the kingdom of god and there are certain things that you need to do and certain things you need to avoid to obtain that kingdom if you're living in sin as a christian you're not going to be in good fellowship with the lord okay read galatians chapter 5 sometime and you'll see what i'm talking about but the kingdom of God can also be a reference to the millennial kingdom. And I'll read two verses here to prove that. Luke chapter 13, verse 28. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. Verse 29. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. So there you have a reference to the kingdom of God being that thousand year kingdom which is coming after the tribulation. But now the kingdom of heaven, uh, <clears throat> the book of Matthew is the only book in the entire Bible that mentions this kingdom of heaven. And it refers to, it always, every time it refers to the physical kingdom there with Jerusalem as the capital city. Matthew chapter 11 verse 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, some people try to teach that the kingdom of heaven is heaven, where God is right now, and where Jesus Christ is. No. When was the last time that the violent took that by force? Obviously, it's not heaven. And, you know, well, maybe it's a spiritual kingdom. Can you take a spiritual kingdom by force? The violent take it by force? No. It is talking about the physical kingdom here on this earth with Jerusalem as the capital city. Matthew chapter 5 verses 34 through 35 says, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jer Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Now, is Jerusalem the city of the great king right now? No. Jesus Christ is not physically in Jerusalem. Will he be someday? 
Yes, Jesus Christ someday will rule and reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. That's not today, though. But see, Jesus Christ was preaching this kingdom of heaven, this gospel of the kingdom. Why was it being preached back then? Because the king was right there. Their king came to them and they rejected him. They said, Caesar, or uh, Pontius Pilate, excuse me, brings Jesus up and he says, Behold your king. And what did the Jews say? They didn't say, Oh, great, we've been waiting for him for a long time. The prophets in the Old Testament said that this would happen. Oh, glory to God. They didn't say that. They said, Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. They rejected Jesus Christ as their king. The kingdom was offered to them. That's why you see in the book of Matthew the kingdom of heaven being preached. This gospel of the kingdom was preached to the Jews. They were offered the spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God, and the physical kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. They rejected it, so it got put off for a while. The church age came in. With the death of Jesus Christ, the New Testament began, and then it will end with the rapture. Then you will have the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation for seven years, and in that time, they're going to start preaching the gospel of the kingdom again. Why? Because Jesus Christ will come back at the end of that tribulation time period to set up his kingdom on this earth. So that's what that is about there. Okay, but what is the gospel that we preach right now? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and faith in that as the payment for your sins. That's the gospel that's preached right now. Okay, the gospel of the grace of God and Jesus Christ dying on the cross to pay for your sins. That's what we preach. We do not preach the gospel of the kingdom. And it's interesting because as time goes on, I'm seeing more and more professing Christians. And I say professing because I don't know if they're saved or not. Uh, a lot of these modern Christians can fool you. You know, they're just really falling away and resisting the Holy Spirit. But a lot of them are starting to preach this thing of the kingdom. The kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Uh, we shouldn't be preaching that right now. They're going to preach it in the tribulation, but not right now. We're not to set up a kingdom. We're not going to have revival. We're not going to have a, a bringing back of solid biblical Christianity. No, it's going to get worse and worse until the Lord takes us out of here and then he pours out his wrath for seven years. So let's continue on here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. And the funny thing is that most people that read it don't understand it. <laughs> because you have Christians going and trying to use Matthew chapter 24 to prove doctrine for today, and it doesn't work. But what is this thing of this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place? Well, Daniel chapter 8, verse 13 and 14 says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden under foot? And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay, the Antichrist is going to set up his, himself as... God to be worshipped in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And we're going to see that here in a little bit. And then the Lord is going to come down and take him out, basically. He's going to get rid of the Antichrist, and the temple will be cleansed. Daniel 9, verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice, sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations... He shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, speaking of the Antichrist, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. 
and arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. Now, to clarify this, we'll go into the New Testament, Second Thessalonians verses two, or sorry, chapter two, verses three and four says, "Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God." or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, right now, there is no temple in Jerusalem for this to happen. So at some point in the future, I don't know how long it'll be, but eventually, I think that the Temple Mount there, the Dome of the Rock, the Islamic Temple in Jerusalem, eventually is going to be destroyed. And I don't know by what means, if it'll be war or an earthquake, or I don't know. But eventually it will be destroyed. And when the Antichrist shows up, that temple will be rebuilt there. And the Jews will be allowed to begin their system of sacrifices in that temple, the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And in the middle of the week, also known as seven years there, seven days, seven years is what the week is referring to there. In the middle of that seven-year period, the time of Jacob's trouble, the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist is going to say, okay, you can't sacrifice to this God of yours in heaven because I am God. He's, he, will be, he will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Okay, so at that point, things are going to really get bad, and we're going to see that here as we continue on. Now, again... How can you make this work if you're a Christian? I'm going to show you why it doesn't work. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, how can you force Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, how can you force that onto a Christian? It doesn't work. The Antichrist can't stand in our holy place because our holy place, as Christians in the body of Christ, is our body. Our own bodies are the temple of the living God. So something has to happen there. The rapture happens, and at that point, the Holy Spirit indwelling the body of Christian believers, that will be gone. That's not going to happen. Okay? Now let's continue on here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 16. And here again we have another problem with trying to teach that Matthew 24 refers to Christians. It says, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now what are Gentile Christians doing in Judea? See? It's referring to Jews. Matthew 24 is written to the Jews. All right, let's look at verse 17 through 19. Let him which is on the housetop not come back to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Now I'm going to read what this is, what this is speaking of. Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Now that happened. Okay, and we're going to talk about that in just a little bit here. But Jerusalem, Israel is a nation. Today. Okay, so this has already taken place. Jeremiah 30, verse 4. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Is there peace in Jerusalem right now? No. There's no peace over there. Verse 6. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. 
It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Okay, the Jews go right into the tribulation. Right now, a Jew on the street of Israel, most of them do not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Okay, they do not accept him as their Messiah. They will in the tribulation because there will be signs for them to see to confirm the New Testament. But the point is, they're not going to be able to take the mark of the beast, so they can't buy or sell. They won't be able to buy food. Okay, but let's look at verse 8 here. Jeremiah 30, verse 8. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Now is Jesus, or I'm sorry, is God going to raise David back, and David will come back down here and rule? No. David, their king there, is speaking of the position of David being king. And Jesus Christ there will sit on the throne of David one day. That's what that's talking about. But let's continue here. Jeremiah 30, verse 10. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity, and Jacob shall return and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Right now the Jews, because of their rejection of Jesus Christ, a lot of them are involved in some very wicked things. And God's going to correct them. But he's not going to make a full end of them. The nation of Israel is going to be attacked very fiercely, savagely, during this tribulation period which is coming. But God's going to preserve them. Okay? And uh, basically the Antichrist, as I said earlier, will break his word with the Jews in the middle of the great tribulation. And things get bad from that, really bad from that point on. But let's continue here. Matthew 24, verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Well, again, how can you apply that to a Christian? You can't. We are not told to keep the Sabbath day in the Pauline epistles. Okay, Paul lists the Ten Commandments there in the book of Romans, and he never says anything about the Sabbath day. And why is that? Well, because the Jews were the ones to whom the Sabbath day, Sabbath day was given. It was a sign. Exodus chapter 31. Uh, well, let me, before I say that, I'll read another verse here. Revelation fourteen twelve. we read earlier. It says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So you see the Ten Commandments coming back. They're for the Jews in the tribulation. Okay, Exodus chapter 31, verses 12 through 17. We're going to read about the Sabbath what the purpose of it was. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now, does it say that the Sabbath day should be kept until, you know, the New Testament? Now you don't have to. No. It's a sign to the Jews, to the children of Israel, that they have to keep perpetually, forever. Okay? So when God turns from Jew and Gentile being saved today... And he turns exclusively to the nation of Israel to deal with them in the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation. When he turns to them, the Sabbath day comes back. 
That's why in Matthew 24, verse 20, you have a warning about pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. That's why it comes back. All right, now let's continue. Matthew 24, verse 21 and 22. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Okay, now you say, well, that's not possible. How can you scientifically, you know, prove that, that the days are going to be shortened? Well, something interesting in Joshua chapter 10, verse 12 through 14. Let me read that quick. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like it, like that before it or after it, and that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Boy, I'd sure hate to be an Amorite, <laughs> knowing that the Lord is, is fighting for the Israelites and, in fact, stops the sun from going down so that the Israelites can wipe them all out. Pretty amazing. So God actually lengthened a day in the past, Okay, which is very interesting. Interesting. And God, it says there, that the days are going to be shortened in that tribulation time period so that some of the Israelites will be saved. Because if God doesn't shorten the days, they would all be wiped out. So yes, I do believe that God will supernaturally shorten the days in the tribulation. And we'll talk about that, of course, in a little bit more detail as we continue here. You're going to see how that ties in. Let's look. go on to Matthew 24, verses 23 through 25. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Okay? And again, you have them people coming out saying that they are Christ. As I stated earlier, many religious leaders are doing this now. Um... A lot of the, even Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons are starting to call themselves Christians. They never did that in the past. So watch out for this thing of these false Christs. And notice that they bring signs and wonders. If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, it says the Jews require a sign. So the deception there is mainly pointed at the Jews, which is the ones that are referred to there, the very elect of verse 24. Now let's continue. Matthew 24, verse 26. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret cham chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Jesus Christ is not going to come back during the tribulation and check in on the Jews to see how they're doing. No, he comes back at the end. Okay, and, and they can people say, well, yeah, okay, well, then we can look and see when the Antichrist shows up, and then we'll just count seven years to the day from then. No, that doesn't work because the days are shortened, if you remember. So no one's really going to be able to tell the day when Jesus Christ is going to come back. All right? And... uh and when Jesus does return, by the way, it's described in Revelation 19, which I want to read here quickly, because this is very important. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath 
of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So that's where the eagles are gathered together and, and the carcass being there. Okay, That's what's being referred to there in Matthew chapter 24, verse 28. Matthew 24, verse 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Okay, now, again, you can't make this the rapture. Okay, the rapture is happens in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. This event here is the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you can read a lot more detail, by the way, if you want to read the book of Joel sometime. You'll see a lot about this second coming. Okay, the, the rapture of the body of Christ was a mystery first revealed to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's why he calls it a mystery. Let's continue on here, Matthew 24, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now why does it why does it say the tribes of the earth are going to mourn? Well, if you read Revelation chapter seven verses one and eight, one through eight, excuse me, the twelve tribes show up again, and they are Jewish tribes. Again, you cannot make Matthew twenty four into church age doctrine. It just doesn't work. It is for Jews in the tribulation. Matthew 24, verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Okay? Matthew 25, verse 31 says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Okay, the Jews that make it through the tribulation are going to be scattered into every nation. They flee, okay? They get out of Jerusalem when the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation, you know, basically stands uh, in the temple and calls the sacrifice to cease. They get out of there. And the angels, which I believe, if you listen to the message on angels, I believe are resur resurrected Christians, Okay, we are resurrected at the beginning of the tribulation and we are given incorruptible bodies and we come back and we are called angels at that point. It doesn't mean we have wings. Okay, there are no angels with wings in the Bible. There are cherubs, cherubim, seraphim. They have wings. Angels never do. Okay, you can study that. Look up all the references to angels and show me one time where it says that they have wings. They don't. Okay, but we are going to come back down with Jesus Christ at the end of the tribulation, and we are going to go and gather all the people that are left here on this earth and bring them to Jesus Christ to be judged. The sheep are going to go on his right hand and are going to inherit the millennial kingdom. The goats will go on the left and they're going to go to hell at that point. Okay, Matthew 24, verse 32 through 35. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now what is this fig tree? Jeremiah 24 verse 1. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs 
were set before the temple of the Lord after that Nebuchadnezzar, uh, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the carpenters and smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe, and the other basket had very naughty figs, which could not be eaten, they were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs, the good figs, very good, and the evil, very evil, that cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them, and not pull them down, and I will plant them, and not pluck them up. And I will give them in heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And as the evil figs which cannot be eaten, they are so evil, surely thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land and them that dwell in the land of Egypt. And I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt, to be a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. So you see the good figs there in verse 5 are those that are carried away captive of Judah. The evil figs are said in verse 8 to be Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem. So the figs are the Jews. The fig tree is the nation of Israel. Okay, Matthew chapter 21 verses 18 through 20 says, Now in the morning as he returned into the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it, let no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever, and presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? What is being done there is Jesus is prophesying that Israel is going to be destroyed as a nation. And they were. Okay? That's what's being shown there. And now people say, well, he said that, you know, the, that no fruit grow on thee henceforward forever. Well, Jesus was speaking of that one tree right there. But symbolically, he was showing that Israel was not producing any fruit at that point. Spiritual fruit, there was none. So he, re he was rebuking Israel as the fig tree. But then what happens is there that he was talking about in, uh, let me see here, verse 32 through 35, it talks about, the parable of the fig tree, when, the, when his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So Jesus is saying, when Israel becomes a nation, the fig tree, when the fig tree is reborn, that generation that sees that, they will not totally pass away. They will not all pass away until all these things be fulfilled. The, all these things that are going to be fulfilled is the events of the tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ. So this happened in uh, 1948. Israel became a nation. So you're going to still have a lot of Jews that are still alive today that were either born in 1948 or were alive in 1948, and they saw the rebirth of Israel as a nation, and those Jews, some of them, are going to still be around to see all the events of the tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is very amazing when you think about it, because that means the rapture is going to happen pretty soon. Okay, let's continue here. And by the way, I just want to say, too, that Jesus seals this promise to Israel with a promise that God's word will not pass away. You need to remember that. Matthew 24, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now what is that day? Well, verse 37 defines it. But as the days of Noah were, Noe, I guess is how you pronounce it, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
That's the day that no man knows. Okay, the day of the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, it's verse 36 is where the day is uh, spoken of. Verse 37 defines it. Now Matthew 24, verse 38 through 39. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now it's kind of interesting because Noah... Uh, said, it's spelled Noe, N-O-E, there in the New Testament, because you have, in the Old Testament, Noah is Hebrew coming to English. New Testament, you have Greek coming to English. So it's same name spelled differently. But Noah is a type of the tribulation saint. There's a lot of things that you can compare the two, and they're very similar. Uh, just go over a couple of these. Number one, Noah was saved from the flood, but he had to go through it. Now, tribulation Jew that's saved, will be saved from the tribulation, but they have to go through it, just like Noah. Um, secondly, Noah was saved along with animals. He had some animals on that ark. And I do believe that there are going to be some Gentiles that will be saved along with the Jews, the nation of Israel. I think that there will be some Gentiles that, that are saved too in that tribulation time period. And it's kind of you know interesting because the Jews... An Orthodox Jew calls a Gentile a dog. So, a little bit of similarity there, too. And third, Noah's, Noah was put someplace safe, okay, before God's wrath was poured out on the lost. And in like manner, you have the Jews in the tribulation, basically, that are fleeing. You have, well, actually, you have the 144,000 that are sealed, and God protects them for a time essentially, but then you also have Jews that are fleeing into the wilderness to be protected, and God will provide for them there. All right, now let's continue here. Matthew chapter 24, verses 40 through 42. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Now these verses are often used to prove the rapture. And, you know, there is some application there. I'll, I'll grant you that. You will have some saved people and some lost people that are at work together, and all of a sudden the saved Christian leaves and the lost are left there. Yes, there is some application. But these verses specifically have to do with Jews leaving Jerusalem, being taken out of Jerusalem, and I think probably more specifically, there, when we come back with Jesus, the angels of God come back with Jesus, and we go and we gather together his elect. Okay, I think that that's what's mainly being spoken of there. But there's another application, and that is to the Jews that are in Jerusalem, and they see the Antichrist standing in the, in the temple, the rebuilt temple, and causing the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and they have to flee into the wilderness. And uh, <clears throat> I think that that's going to be partly what happens here. Let me read Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 37. Here it says, And as it was in the days of Noe, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Yeah. Verse 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, the one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken, and the other left. Now look at verse 37, Luke 17, verse 37. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? Where are they going to be taken, in other words? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Now, this is clearly a reference to the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation 19. 
And you can go over that again. Read it in more detail to see that that's true. Okay, and then next we see in Revelation chapter 12 that the Jews basically flee Jerusalem, which is interesting because Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt in Revelation 11.8. So you have Lot fleeing, having to flee Sodom, and you have the Jews in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, leaving Egypt. Very interesting. And they, they do this about halfway through the tribulation. And um, I'm not going to read all the verses there because we're running out of time here, but it says Revelation chapter 12, verses 12, down through 17, it talks about this woman fleeing into the wilderness, the woman there. If you look at the whole passage, it's very clearly the nation of Israel. It's not Mary, it's not the church. It is the nation of Israel. Okay, and the dragon, I'll read verse 17. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, the dragon is Satan. And you have him basically, I think, uh, possessing the body of the Antichrist about halfway through the tribulation. And they go out, him and the armies, the false prophet and their armies, are going to wipe out the Jews. That's what their purpose is. They're not going out to fight Jesus Christ per se. I think that they're actually going to destroy the Jews. Okay? And the Jews that are going and leaving Jerusalem, they're going to get a front row seat, essentially, to Jesus Christ coming back and wiping out the Antichrist and his army so that there will be no confusion about who saved whom. Okay? It isn't that all oh, the tribulation saints are going to rise up and defeat the Antichrist and then Jesus will come back. No. Jesus Christ comes back. He is the solution. He is the one who will fix up this world's problems and be the ultimate King of kings and Lord of lords. But let's uh, keep going here. We're almost done. Matthew 24, verses 43 through 44. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Okay? A Jew that knows the Bible in this tribulation time period can escape with some of their things, can escape with their family. Okay? And that's because they know the Word of God. They know what's going to happen. But a Jew that doesn't know is basically going to have to either flee or he's going to have to, to go over to the side of the Antichrist. And we're going to see that here in verses 45 through 51, which, of course, is the end of Matthew chapter 24 here. So let's finish this off. Matthew chapter 24, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you read Revelation 12, you will see that the Jews have to be out in the wilderness for three and a half years. Halfway through the tribula tribulation, the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped, and they flee, they get out of there, and they are taken care of in the wilderness for three and a half years. Now, towards the end of that three and a half years, it's going to be getting kind of old. They're going to start saying, you know, it's going to be just like in the book of Exodus. They're going to be wishing that they could go back to Egypt and saying, why did we come out here? We're going to be slaughtered. And then the worst part is they'll eventually see the Antichrist and his troops, the 200 million man army mentioned in the book of Revelation, coming after them to wipe them out. And so they're actually going to say, my Lord delayeth his coming. Jesus isn't coming. It's, it's all a lie. We have, to, we have to get out of here. And you're going to have some of the Jews losing their faith and saying, I can't take it anymore. I'm going back to Jerusalem. I'm going to take the mark so that I can get a decent meal and so I can get my house back. 
I want my things back. I'm going. I'm leaving. And that's what's going to happen. They're going to lose their faith. They are not going to endure to the end. And at that point, those that do that, when Jesus Christ does eventually return, those Jews that left the faith and took the mark are going to go to hell. It isn't, well, you know, you had the, you, you prayed the sinner's prayer, so now you're in and you don't have to worry about it. No. You take that mark, you don't endure to the end, and you will go to hell. Okay? Now, for a Christian, do not be deceived by Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is doctrinally not pointed at you. Okay, everybody that teaches that there is no pre-tribulation rapture, every single one of them will use Matthew 24 or Mark 13 or Luke 21 or Luke 17. They all have to use it. Okay, but you have to understand it is pre-crucifixion, so doctrinally is pointed at the Jews. And you read the context, there's no way it can be referring to Gentile Christians in the body of Christ. It is to the Jews, written to the Jews. Okay. So that's it for the study of Matthew chapter 24. Um, Jesus is coming back soon to redeem or to uh, remove his bride from off the earth. And then the nation of Israel is going to come back into the main scene in God's plan for the world. And Jesus Christ is going to come back at the end of it. And he is going to be the one that fixes everything up. Not Christians, not tribulation saints. Jesus Christ will be the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the one who is going to fix up this rotten, wicked planet. And only Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.